Now we're in Romans. Lesson number 38, call it the chosen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for choosing us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the word of God, for its clarity. Lord, open it to us this morning. Help me to get out of the way and for us to see you in your face. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we went over some of this last week, and I've got to get a, a running start at this. So let's look at this idea of the called. In 828, he establishes who he's going to talk about. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So verse 28 on, he's talking about this group of people that are called by God and that they love God. Continuing on 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, when we look at this, um, we're going to look at this idea of who, what, and why, and, and the, that's, that's the order in 829. So the first thing he says is, for whom he did foreknow. So that's who he's talking about. The ones that he foreknew, and I'm going to look at that more today, those that he foreknew or those that he called, that's who he's talking about. Second, he's going to talk about what he did to them. So those that he called or foreknew, those were predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the what he's doing and the why he's doing it. And this is my favorite part. This is the why he's doing it. He's doing it because he wants to be the firstborn among many brethren. And we see this one connection, this one purpose behind what God's doing from Adam all the way until the end of the millennium, that God's got a design, a purpose that we just read about, purposed after the good pleasure of his own will, after his own counsel, he's purposed this thing that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, it, it bears talking about this, this order that we come up with in what we call soteriology or, or the, the, the order of salvation. And we get together and we come up with a list of what takes place and when. So first is God foreknew, then predestinated, then called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. This is why I'm not an Armenialist or a Calvinist. Because if you, if you take the classic understanding of the Armenialists or the understanding of who a Calvinist is, the idea is the order of events, right? It's what took place when. Both are incorrect. And the reason is because we're looking at it from our perspective. We're looking at it through the lens of time. So what happens first? Are you foreknown first or are you glorified first? Well, from our perspective, you're foreknown first. But from God's perspective, the glorified is past tense. You see that. He says, for whom he did, them he also glorified, past tense. So from God's perspective, you're already glorified. From God's perspective, he's designing Eve in, in the garden right now with Adam's rib, and he's also eating supper with me, his wife, gathered around the table. This is, this is God because no time is passing with God. So if we look at it from God's perspective, we take away the order and they have this one thing that he started with. Remember verse 28, he said to them, who love God. Do you love God? Then you've got the order. That's the order. You either love God or you don't love God. You say, yeah, but you have to believe and you have to repent and you have, the yes, do you love God? That's the order. That's the answer. That's what you, do you believe because you love God? Do you repent because you love God? You either love God or you don't. That's the order. You're called. How do you know if you're called? You love God. How do you know? We're going to get more into that. But this is the, 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 discussions that we have amongst ourselves as the church are from our perspective and not God's. And when God talks about predestination, when he talks about foreknowledge or being called, when he talks about these things, he talks about them often from his perspective. And we start jotting down notes and, and we get a bunch of dry, dusty old men and dusty old libraries pontificating about the order of events. And if you get the order wrong, you're not part of my circle. Do you love God? then we're part of the same circle. Okay, so whom he did foreknow. This is the who of verse 29, and we're going to ask this question. Does God know you? You know, if you ask yourself one question in life, this is it. 
Do you remember the, the story where Christ said in that day there's many that are going to come and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. What? I never knew you. Does God know you? Now, when, when he says whom he foreknew, do you think there's people that God didn't know were going to exist? He didn't know who they were. He didn't know the names. He says what? He knows every hair on every head. He knows every sparrow that falls. God has knowledge of everybody. But that's not what he's talking about when he says foreknow. And I, I'm going to show you from Scripture what he's talking about. And there's, it's beautiful. I, I've, I've enjoyed it so much this week. 2 Timothy 2.19. He says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows those that are his. Now, again, we're finite, so we think of it like a list. Like, I, I know Alex. I know Alex better than I know many of you because I know what Alex has for, I know what his bedroom looks like. I've been in there putting furniture in there. I know where his house is. I know how deep his pool is. It's about that deep. I, I know Alex, and I know other people here. God's not talking about that kind of a knowledge. God's talking about an intimacy with us that stretches from eternity past to eternity future. Everything that you'll ever do, does God know you? Are you known by him? Not your name, not just your favorite color. Everything you've ever thought and done, is it, is it uh, your desire to be with God and does he know you? Now, the Bible says that this is the foundation that's standing sure that God knoweth them that are his. Let's move on. Genesis 4.1 gives us an a, uh, understanding of what this knowledge is. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. See, when, when Adam and Eve came together as husband and wife, and made a son, God says they knew each other then. That's the kind of knowledge he's talking about. Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. You see, when God's talking about knowledge, now you go, well, that's kind of tacky to talk about it in physical sense. Well, marriage is not a good illustration for the relationship that we have with, with the son. Marriage is a, it's a scale model of the relationship. In other words, God didn't come in and make man and, and then go, whoa, oh, oh, he's missing something. That's the conversation he had with Adam, right? Oh, it's not good for man to be alone. God was not surprised. God understood that before he made man. As a matter of fact, before he made man, he had already taken a book and written the names down of his beloveds that he knew. He knew me. My name was written down before he made Adam in a book sealed with the blood of his son that was going to be the, the descendant of David. And before God made Adam, God, that was done. The ink was dry. Why? Because God's eternal. Because when God created time and space and man, he placed us in this, this time capsule, this, rel this relativity, and he's outside of it. And he's experiencing both at the same time. And so when he makes Adam and he goes, oh, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. God wasn't surprised. He was working with Adam. Adam was an infant in understanding and in experience. So God's teaching Adam something. So God says, well, let's look through the animals. Maybe we'll find a help meet there for you. So they looked. Did God think they would? Of course not. God knew what was taking place, but God's designing something, and he's teaching Adam something. So he looks through the animals. Nope, not there. I tell you what, I'll take a rib, and I'll make, I'll make a woman for you. I'll make a help that's meat for you. So God takes a rib, and he makes a woman, and wow, Adam's like, wow, a woman. She's beautiful. She's everything I could hope and desire for. Exactly. God wanted you to understand what it means to desire, what it means to come together in a knowledge and we're not capable of understanding that so as an infant, as a race. So God designed marriage so that when the real thing came, the actual thing, the son and the church, we would understand what it means. You see, God is love. Every expression of love is an expression of God's love. 
everything from the moment that you're born. And, and, and the first time that your eyes kind of, you know, your baby's are, eyes are crossed. And the first time those eyes kind of uncross and they look and they see mama's nose and they're like, wow, that's the thing that gives me comfort. It's the, that's all they know. They're just babies. They're infants. The smell and the, and the sound of her voice that I've been hearing in the womb, that's what gives me comfort. Listen, that grasping, reaching hand, nothing could describe our relationship with the Father better than this grasping, reaching hand. Something that doesn't understand the broader sense of what's of reality, that barely understands who God is and who I am, that barely has a grasp of, of the eternal and the magnificence of God and says, I love you. I love you and you love me. There's no, there's no better expression. And then the child grows and the child comes to know mom and dad and, and takes his first wobbly steps. And dad looks at his son and he's so proud of these two or three stupid steps. Do you, do you remember that? I remember when my daughter, she's been married a year today. Congratulations. I remember when, ah, I remember when my daughter, we were, we were on this job out in Dixon where we put this roof on and and there's this, this field, and I was driving by that about a couple years ago, and I was like, oh, I put that roof on. The boy said, I don't remember. And I go, you know you don't. Laura took her first steps in that yard. I, you remember that, baby? We were, we were there, and, and she took her first wobbly steps. I was so proud. I was so happy. It was like the greatest thing that anybody's kid had ever done. Nobody's kid ever took steps as cool as my kid took steps. It was awesome. Listen, that expression of love is God towards us. It's so that we understand a little bit better how God looks down at your fumbling attempts to love him and walk with him and know him. Well, God looks down and he goes, I'm so proud of you. I'm so thankful for you doing this thing. Not because we've accomplished something incredible that no one else has ever accomplished, but because God loves us. Isn't that incredible? Does God know you? Does he have this relationship because he... He only has this relationship with those that love him. How about when you get a little older and, and you stand there, and this is my story, stand there on, on the altar waiting for your beloved. And, and you're, and you're kind of breathless, right? You're just kind of excited and your, your hands are sweating and, and you're so happy. And then the door opens and, and here's that pretty red head she's got on that white dress and she's walking down and she's yours forever. That expectation, that desire, that, that just longing for my bride to come and to be mine. What a glorious day. And, and that's God's expression, teaching me. This is the hope that my bride has as they're waiting for all those that hope for his appearing, love his appearing. You see, I couldn't understand that. I couldn't even begin to, to understand that without that relationship with my wife. And then my first daughter, when she came, when she was born, the absolute love I had for her, I, I, you can't understand that. You see, God didn't make a, he didn't come and die and say, you know, I need a good example. I'll pick marriage. You know, God made marriage as a scale model. When years ago, I built a, a church a building for a, for a friend down the road and, and they had a, they had this old dilapidated church, had a cool story. It's an old country church. They, the pastor used to live across the river before they had a bridge, so he would swim the river with his mule every Sunday morning from Decaturville over and, and then ride up to preach there in Tom's Creek. I remember that every time I have to get up early to do the sound here, that, that I don't have to swim a mule to get here. Um, it's a cool old country church, but it was all dilapidated and moldy and the room was leaking. And so they wanted a new one. And so they kind of designed one. So what they did was they took the old dilapidated church and said, let's make it like upright with no mold. And they're like, oh, right. Yeah. So that's what they brought to me. And I go, that's a terrible design. And then, and then well, why is it a terrible design? It's like, because you have 40 feet of hallway that's three feet wide to get to the classrooms at the back. It's, it's like a something out of a horror movie. It's just terrible. It's terrible design. So I said, what is it that you want? What do you need? So they started describing, I want this class and kitchen and this and that and the other. And so I went and I built a scale model. I, I took their plans and their ideas and I fixed them because I've been building my whole life and I can, I can sit down in the evening and, 
And I can build something in my head and put all the pieces and walk around and look and open the door. And how big is it? Oh, I need more lights on that side. All that happens in my crazy imagination. So I built a scale model of what was in my head. And I, I took my table saw and chop saw and a hot glue gun and took a couple of pieces of plywood. And I built the, the rooms and, and put the little uh, stage up there, a little pulpit for the preacher to preach from. I, I, I put the classrooms in and colored in the kitchen and and built the roofs and uh, the two different the fellowship and the church and and I set them over that where I could pull them off and look at it and and when I got there and I and I put the scale model for the congregation they were like whoa this is awesome look Betty Lou can teach in that classroom and oh yeah Martha's gonna love oh we need to move the sink over that so they could understand it right they could look at it and get my vision for what it was gonna be because there was a scale model of it. They were excited then. They raised money and we built that church and it was it was a beautiful thing to see the congregation come into the church that they had wanted for so long. It looked nothing like their old ratty building. I did a really nice job. And and so when God got ready to to show us what it is like to be in love and to be desired, you understand that? To be desired by the infinite immortal omnipotent God for him to want me to be with him forever is beyond my understanding. I still can't grasp it. He says you can't. He says you don't understand what's coming. You, you, eyes not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the imagination of man. The things I have in store for you, you can't get it. But here's the scale model. Here's what it looks like. A man and a woman fall in love and their desires towards each other, and their hope is for each other, and the grace of life, their inheritance, is wrapped up in one another, it tells us. And, 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 then, and then you have life together. You create, and you shepherd, and you disciple these children, and they grow up, and each portion of that life is a representation. It's a, it's a scale model of the love that God has for me. It's an understanding. This is why the devil hates marriage. You ever wonder why marriage is attacked? So, so arduously, God has designed something to show us about his love. The devil comes along and says, hath God surely said? It doesn't matter. Live for the moment. You know, God's designed love that spans the decades. When I fell in love with my wife, we were kids. We were looking at pictures this week. We were kids. We didn't have the beginning of the understanding. We had passion. We, we had plenty of passion, but we were kids. We got married. It was, it was wonderful. But listen, I know my wife today so much better than I knew her then. And she knows me, and we've become one flesh so that we're inseparable. There's nowhere I end and she begins. There's us. And it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Listen, that doesn't happen in fornication. It doesn't happen in a moment or a year or five. It's been a quarter of a century. And we're more in love today than ever because we know each other better. Because we've raised children together. Because we're looking forward to the future with grandchildren and, and with a, a life that, that is glorious together. God's designed that so that we could experience in each moment, each, each section of this. I remember watching my grandparents, Nanny and Daddy Bill, we called them, canning tomato juice in the kitchen. And, and to me, there was, as I think back, there's very few expressions of love that even began to get close to watching them can in the kitchen because they would walk back and forth and, and there's a tiny little kitchen and, and they would miss each other, right? So nanny would have this hot jar, uh, the thing that she's going to pour in the jar and she would step and my grandfather would step back just as she stepped and go around and then he's got the new jar and sets it right back over. It was dancing. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful dance that only an old couple can do after canning jars for years and years. After spending their lifetime in, together and in love and, and enjoying each other, it was a beautiful dance. I remember sitting at the counter as a little boy and watching it and thinking, how do they not spill hot tomato juice all over each other? Listen, you can't experience that the first year of marriage or the sixth or maybe not the 26th. You experience that after 40 or 50 years of being in love and walking together. God wants you to know what his mature love for you is like. God wants you to know what it's like to take care of their feeble grandparents. After, after they're having difficulty, God wants you to know what it's like in a family to have a new baby. To have all of the points of God's love for us.
the devil comes along and says, no, 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 gratification today, that's what will make you happy. Ignore all that stuff. Jump from spouse to spouse to spouse until they make you a little bit unhappy and then go somewhere else. Listen, God says this is what it looks like, what God has joined together. You understand, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, I understand there's fornication and adultery in marriage. There's legitimate reasons that marriage splits up, godly reasons. But listen, the point, the purpose, the design of marriage is that, is that God would show us what it means for God to love us and for, him to love, for us to love him back. For what it means to be the bride and, and to be the one that is providing for your bride and, and preparing for her and, and ministering to her. You know, when God got ready to talk about it in the Song of Solomon, he said, I am my beloved's. And his desire is towards me. You know, this is, this is my prayer to the Father. You understand how special this is? How incomprehensible that the eternal God, that I can look at him in the face and say, your desire is towards me. Aren't you glad that the Bible is a love story? Aren't you glad that it's filled with pages of this love that God has for us? He says, my beloved, Psalm, uh, Song of Solomon 2.10, my beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. You ever feel like that with your bride? Just go for a walk with me. Come, come and look at the, what I built. Come and look, the, the, the engine's running the way it's supposed to. You can tell I'm a redneck. Uh, come and come and look. We painted the room. Look at the new color. Isn't it beautiful? I, I tell my boys, look, we haven't done anything cool until mama's seen it. If we're doing something, it's not finished. It's not cool until mama comes and goes, oh, then, then, I'm, then I'm satisfied. Then, all right, now it's good. Now I've done it. Until then, I'm just preparing for that moment when I show my beloved the things that I've accomplished. You see, the, the, the father has gone to prepare, or the son has gone to prepare a place because he wants his beloved to come and be with him. Look what it says. He says in John 14, 2, in my father's house, Jesus says, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. The son looks at his bride and he goes, I want you with me. I want to spend time with you. I want to walk with you in my garden and go, the rain is past. Look at the flowers blooming. I want to experience that love with you and that desire with you. You know, physical desire is a scale model. Friends, it's like one-eighth of an inch to 1,000 miles. It's, it, you can't even begin to understand the scale model. I've had older couples come to me in tears and go, will we still be married in heaven? Well, what do you think? No, the Bible says no. All right, so why are you asking me? Because I don't want to be without him forever. I don't want to be without her. And I go, you don't understand. You don't understand. You're like a kid that says, all I want to eat is cotton candy for the rest of my life. You don't understand that there's better things. There's more filling things. There's more wonderful things. God has something wonderful for you. And, and what you're experiencing now is a small piece. It's just a, it's just a tiny glimpse through, through a magnifying glass at this tiny scale model of the glory that God has for you, for those that know God and those that are known by God knows. Isn't, isn't the love story of the Bible so cool? Let me continue on. I'm not going as fast as I meant to. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. And, and to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You know where we get the righteousness? We get it from Jesus. He gets it and he gives it to us. He clothes us in and he brings us to the marriage supper of the lamb. Do you know how Jesus kicked his ministry off? You remember? What was the first thing he did? He went to a wedding. The first thing he did is he went to a wedding. That was, that was his first act as a minister. The, now, he went into the wilderness and was baptized, but that was between him and God. The first act of ministry was when he went to the wedding. He blessed the bride and the groom's family with making the best wine that they'd ever had. 
That was the first thing. When we get to heaven, the first thing that we're going to do is go to a wedding. Our wedding. Our wedding with, with the sun, dressed in white, white robes. And you go, well, that's a little weird. You sound a little, uh, you know, um, uh, modern there, talking about getting married and being a bride. Listen, the way that we understand things today is an order that God placed it in for something that's so far beyond that we can't understand. We can't understand the spiritual knowledge that, that, that we'll have with God, the way that I have carnal knowledge with my wife, the way that we're one flesh together. Th that is a picture of what's coming. Listen, there are, there are no things that God gave us that's more holy than sex between a husband and a wife. It's a beautiful, holy thing that God has designed. Listen, God gave it to us and said, I want you to experience this together because I want you to know what it's like to have this intimacy with me forever and ever. And you can't, you can't get your mind around the spiritual intimacy that we'll have forever. But here's what it's like physically in your finite state. Here's how you can understand it. And this is it spiritually. It's it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And, and Satan can't wait to corrupt it in your children. He can't wait to show them pictures of something that should be holy between a man and a woman and God that should be glorious and make it a cheap, filthy, lousy thing that will forever scar them. Listen, protect your kids, protect your marriage, protect each other. Re recognize that you're not making a covenant before men. You're making a covenant before God and men. That you're making a covenant to that woman that God joins the two of you together or to that man. And let nothing, let no man separate them. Okay, that was for free. Continue on. Revelation 9, 19. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Remember how he started. He said, them that love God who are the called according to his purpose. Here's the purpose. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That he would bring many sons into glory. And that we would be with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where we're going. That's the purpose. That's the outcome. The direction. The design. Jeremiah 1.5. It talks about this knowing the. He says, before I formed thee in the belly. I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, old men get this and pontificate that this means that Jeremiah was predestined to be a prophet and he had no choice. No, this means that God knew Jeremiah personally, intimately, completely from before he was born until after he died. God knew Jeremiah and loved him. And his desire was towards him. And he communed with him. And when Jeremiah is a, a child coming up, this young prophet, God wants to encourage Jeremiah. He wants to tell Jeremiah, look, Jeremiah, I know that this is uh, scary for you. I know that this is a, a, a tough thing that I'm asking of you. But I want you to know something. I know you. I've known you since before you were born. And I'll know you forever. And listen. I know something about you that God's got you, that I've got you, that you are going to do this, not because of who you are now, but because of who I'm making you. Do you ever feel less than worthy before God for something he's called you to? Do you ever feel like I can't do it? What about in your marriage? Do you ever feel like, God, I can't do this anymore? God says, I know, if you know God, if he knows you, he says, I know you from before till the end, and you've got this because I'm in you, and I love her through you. I love him through you. This is what I'm doing in you. Go forth and do it. And you say, but God, I can't. I'm not strong. I've done that. I've, I've come to God and, and said, God, I, this is too much. Not for marriage, for running this place. I've laid on my office floor in there. And I've said, God, I cannot do this. I can't take this. Take it away and give it to somebody else. Call somebody else. I, I just, I, I'm, and God says, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. I knew you, and I know who you are, and I've got this, not you. Shut up and do what I'm telling you to do. Let's see what Jeremiah says. And then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. 
He says, God, Jeremiah, I got this because I've known you since before you were born. I set this thing, this job aside for you. I've sanctified you. I've called you. You are my son and you love me. And here's what we're going to do together. Hold my hand while we go. You know, there's so much comfort in predestination. There's so much comfort in being called by God to the thing that he wants you to do, which is to come and be with him at his wedding. There's so much joy in this, in this relationship of being known by God from the end of the beginning, being known by God. Titus 1.16, it says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Titus is writing, and he goes, There are a bunch of Cretans down here. You know, that's where we get the term Cretan. It's from this book. He's talking about Cretans, people from Crete, from the, that, that island. He goes, these guys are a bunch of Cretans. They're, they're awful people. They say they know God, but they don't act like it. In their mind, they works, they deny him. Listen, if you know God, and if he knows you, be faithful to him. You understand? Be faithful to him. Look what it says here. John 10, 14, he says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father and lay down my life for the sheep. He says, listen, there's an intimacy between me and the Father. We are known. I know him. He knows me. And listen, I know you and am known of you. You know me. You know me and, and, and understand and have a relationship with me. Listen, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, he doesn't have one with you. You understand that? You understand the power of that, the weight of that? You need to be known of God, and you need to know him. You need to walk with him. Look what it says here. John, 1 John 5, 18. We know that whatsoever, whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Does this describe you? Then let it describe you. Choose to know God and be known of him. He says in the book of John, listen, I'm not saying that you're not going to sin. If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, but don't sin. He says, listen, if, if you're born again, you don't sin and you keep yourself. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. He goes, this is the knowledge that we have that we're of God. We belong to him. We, we are his kids and he is our beloved. And his desire is towards us and ours is toward him. The Bible says of the Christians, it says as many as hope for his appearing. That's the description of a Christian. Listen, if you don't hope for the appearing of God, then you're not a Christian. You understand? That's what the Bible says. If you don't look with longing to the Father, come and get me, Dad, I'm ready. Then you're not a Christian. Choose God. Choose to know him. Continue on. John, 1 John 5.20, continuing on. And we know... That the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even the, his son, even in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God in eternal life. He says, listen, I want you to know something that the son came to give us this understanding. Why? So that we could know him. That's why he came to give us an understanding that we might know him that is true and be in him that is true. That's that. That is that connection, that, that intimacy that we have with Christ. Now, what is the understanding? How do we get this understanding? Luke 24, 44, he says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that in all things ye must be that, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and of the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. John's quoting what, he ha what happened back here on the road to Emmaus. He says, Listen, I, Christ opened to us understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That he is the Lamb of God that takes away sin. That he is our propitiation. He is our justification. He sanctified us and called us that we are redeemed in him. This is the understanding we have in Christ. And they're found in the words of the word of God. This is how you get to know him. You know, people have written me in the past and go, I'm not sure that I'm saved. How do I know that I'm saved? And I tell them, read the Bible. Yeah, but, 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 no, 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 buts. Read the Bible. Get to know Jesus. 
But how do I, how do I know? Because he said, seek and you'll find. Open the book and seek. Well, how do I know that I know him? Because you love him. Open the book and find out what he wants and then do it. Open the book and find out who he is and get closer. Open the book and find out what he's planned for you and try to get in line for the plan that he's got for you. There's nothing better than this love. There's nothing more fulfilling. Matthew 7, 23. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. Work, ye that work iniquity. That's the other side of it. If we are, are walking against God, if we don't love him, if we're not desiring to be with him, then you don't believe him. If you believe Christ, if you believe on him, you're born again that moment. That's it. There's nothing to do but believe him. But listen, if you believe him and you're born again, you love him. You can't help it. And if you don't love him, you haven't believed on him. You haven't put your faith and your trust and your desire toward him. You haven't repented toward him. You're not confessing him. Trust him. Believe on him. Don't be a cretin. Don't confess with your mouth and then with your works deny. Trust Jesus and get to know him that he might know you. Okay, I'm going to stop there because I, I definitely don't have time to get into this, right? Isn't it good to be known by God, to be loved by God? I, uh, I, I fell more in love with Jesus this week. I feel like that happens all the time. The, the, the longer I live, the more that I walk with him, the closer I get, the more I enjoy it, the more I want to. And I, I can't wait. Me and John, we're ready to go, aren't we, brother? We're ready to go to glory. Okay, let's pray. Father.